uh, they say you're kind of formed by your early career experience. So I was a youth worker in my early, early years in, in paid work. And this is very um, similar setting to the youth work setting. Uh, as I came up the stairs, I was brought back to going up the stairs in a community house, which was um, given to us by the corporation in, uh, in a part of Galway. Uh, similar to the, the uh, type of scenario we're talking about where a uh, housing estate built on the edge of Galway and a lot of the families who would have grown up in the inner city moved out there. Uh, and the uh, places we did or tried to do our work were usually uh, cold and, uh, you know, <laughs> nicely f fresh. And um, there would certainly be loads of engaged uh, discussion, but it would very quickly get on to, so what are we going to do? And uh, young people, and you could see maybe some of those uh, perspectives in the film as well last night, uh, they want to move on to action. Um, they're happy to discuss, but they want to, to do something. So um, what I want to offer you, which is the second thing I want to talk about, is uh, it's kind of a, a gift that we were given a couple of years ago, but in the way of the world. It's a virtual gift. Um, um, an academic in Australia uh, gave us this gift, and uh, we tried it out. And uh, I found that it's uh, really useful. So I was just checking my sources. Jane Thompson wrote a couple of years ago about really useful knowledge, or our UK. There was merely useful knowledge in the UK, and then there was fairly useless knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I like the our UK a bit. I like the really useful knowledge. Um, I also speak about walking up O'Donovan's Road in Cork and seeing applied social studies up on the wall outside one of the houses that UCC owned. And the applied bit is the bit that appeals to me. Um, I was interested in this idea that Peter Carrant was the name of the man uh, who came from Australia. He, he brought this idea to us and uh, I was really interested in applying it and seeing would it make any difference. So the question I have which is at the, the heart of today's uh, discussion, is can applying an equal approach add value to our work or your work in the university, in community development, in city development, or in any, any area of work that you're committed to? Can it add value? So we're going to see you know, what might emerge over the space of the next 20, 30 minutes, and uh, we're going to test it out while we're here on a particular project that's starting now in Cork, uh, which Siobhan Sullivan will speak about, called Learning Neighbourhoods. So we're going to see how it works. So um, I suppose like, like, like a lot of the good ideas, one of the, power, one of the powers of it is that's very simple. Um, the idea is that you connect uh, concerns around health, learning, the environment, the economy and social inclusion, and you bring them all to bear on any particular theme. So the first thing you have to ask is, um, because it was, we've been organised through um, most of our lives and through, and particularly the, the you know the way the state works in departments and silos and uh, collectives, uh, but they typically can be uh, silo types. So we're used to working in, in pillars or in groups where there's a lot of, of um, commonality. And I suppose you know, when you look around the room today, <coughs> this group wouldn't be, wouldn't be any different to that. But what we always try to do is to ask the question about uh, who's in the room. And accepting that any group that come together because they want to come together are the right group. Uh, but who is in the room? So um, one way of thinking about it is, uh, we did introductions yesterday, so people said who they were, and where they work, or who they were, what label they were kind of wearing. Uh, but we found through working with Deca well that often people uh, in their hearts are wearing a different hat. So they might be working in a university, so they're working in the learning sphere. But in their hearts, they might really have a passion for uh, making a fortune. So they might be, that's not that typical, but, uh, uh, or they might be really passionate about um, the environment. So I'm going to ask you to reintroduce yourselves, and I'll start uh, with, with Gibson, if, if you don't mind, just to say again. Uh, where, where you're based, but what hat would you wear today? You can wear a green hat if you're committed to the environment. Yeah. And it's not absolute, I mean, obviously lots of different, different things. Uh, you can wear a red hat if you're interested in health, you to get a red cross. Uh, we're going for the blue bloods for the economy, you can wear a blue hat if you're interested in the economy. Um, you can wear the orange hat for interested in community and culture. And you can wear 
yellow hash for the for learning, which I know that's your, your main job would say. So those are the colors. I'm not allowed a rainbow hat then. <laughs> <laughs> if you wish. <laughs> uh, it would be an academic hat. Uh, I've been an academic all my life. You know, it, it's what I really enjoy, what I love. But of course, the it does tie in uh, into those other ones. But uh, I self-identify as an academic. So you're aware of yellow. Yellow if you force me to wear a yellow hat, I will. Yeah. In Ashington, it wouldn't look good, but I will. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tony? Um, well, I sort of see the same as Gibson was saying, it'd be more multicoloured, but yeah. um, if I picked any one, it'd probably be more towards the sort of green hat today. I think what Seamus was saying before sort of struck me, I think it's very important to how things are converging at the time, like modern society. And we're heading towards so basically a cliff where some, there's a, a really serious need for change. So I think, you know, if we're, um, I think we're holding our know, systems upside down, and we seem to say economy first, environment second, well, it's the other way, really. It's environment and resources first, and keeping our planet sort of healthy, and us healthy. Yeah. Economics is sort of, you know, but that'll get the poor second for me. So, big green hat today. Okay, thanks, Tony. I have no idea. Um, I'm an artist and I learn everything about the world all the time that goes into my arts. I really want the arts to teach everybody everything I learned about the world. I don't know what that happened. Just... Well, I suppose community and culture is a broad term for anything in the yeah. arts or community or the world. Well, I suppose then, yeah. It's an everything I do. Today, so yeah. I yeah, I'll do. Arms, but yeah, it's an artistic kind of. Um, Approach to things that's yeah, I did creative ways of representing knowledge. Yeah. yeah. I guess I'd mainly wear a yellow hat, but um, with certain other kind of maybe community or activist kind of tinged kind of colours coming yeah. in. Um, I remember my in my current position, I remember Carl was sitting on the interview panel. I mentioned that. I, I had uh, done a stint in pirate radio. I don't know. I don't know why I said that. I don't know. <laughs> it, 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 it didn't stand too much against me anyway. It was weighed in the balance. Um, so I mean, I strongly believe in people self-organisation, people doing it for themselves. And we saw some of that in the blueberry soup film um, yesterday. I mean, the, but and I don't think anybody, probably nobody here in the, in the room would disagree that there's a, a kind of potential pitfall in that is that if you do it for yourself, that you're um, it's like social inclusion, that the, um, the societal obligation, if you like, to addressing the structural factors and the structural imbalances may get ignored, so mainly yellow. Other little tinges. A bit of orange there as well. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, I'm going to go for the green hat mm -hmm. today. Uh, something uh, that's uh, important to me in my everyday life is uh, being a vegetarian and uh, growing uh, vegetables in my garden and cooking from that and connecting with other growers whether they're city growers or they're farmers coming to local markets and um, so that's a big part of who I am. Well I think I'd probably go for the blue hat just because nobody is going for it. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that yeah. we need a radically different economy in order to solve a lot of these other problems and um, so I mean I'm one of the things I'm involved in is basic income movement and the idea of you know replacing the existing kind of tax and social welfare system by a system that would give people more economic security and foster economic equality be a transition towards a uh, post-capitalist uh, socialist economy and so I guess a red version of blue. With green spots. <laughs> yeah, I, in an ideal world I'd be blue hat. But I'm not comfortable. I'm comfortable in the orange hat with the green spots. Um, I suppose, like Gibson, I'm an academic, and I think uh, it sort of makes me yellow, and it's precisely because I'm yellow in so many different senses that I'm interested in culture and community because being yellow and being a green vegetarian sort of alienates me from the community that I grew up in, which 
would see all of those things as signs of blatant homosexuality. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks. So uh, my hat is pretty orange, really. Uh, as I said, I started out in working in community settings, and well, I work now in um, a yellow organisation, very much a learning organisation. Um, the, it's the orange hat, really, that, that is, is close to my heart. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> orange uh, community means a whole load to me, but I suppose all the other things there, like health and economy, um, the, I'm interested when you put community in front of health or education or economics or what that does and who it involves and maybe how it democratizes, um, you know, sort of but have been very silos, but also very professional, kind of solidly middle class silos. Uh, so, so orange that kind of pokes at some of the others. Um, it's blatant. Uh, yeah, blatant homosexuality <laughs> rather than blatant homosexuality. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think as, as a sociologist where there's a tendency for us to self-divide into these artificial kind of camps, I'm going to resist your classification and I'm going to be a traffic light. <laughs> uh, a little bit green, a little bit uh, yellow, a little, a little bit orange. And, and the analogy of the silo is very good because it perfectly fits the university. Mm. We're constantly scanning the horizon and very rarely looking around one another. And I suppose that's part of the connection into things like ego. Mm. Uh, trying to make those connections. We have all these false separations that have developed over a century. And we people in buildings next door compare, you know, interested in the same things. But quite often, you know, we've got to come to maybe Newcastle to talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you're know, multicolored. I'm resisting it. I'm resisting, but I'm working within your parameters. Okay. <laughs> I already have a hat. And uh, I have a homosexual uh, s a story as well. I was in the pub recently <laughs> with my friend. Um, it was after the referendum, and um, lots of people came up and congratulated us on being married to each other. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you never you know, invited me. Yeah, they, Damn. they said, uh, you know, they said it, it's great to see how it's once for how they all form this opinion of us was <laughs> a little bit mysterious to us, but anyway, we did well, now. Maybe that was it. Maybe that was it. So I need to help with that man. But it was it was it was a bit of fun actually. Yeah, that was somebody said, oh, yeah, it's great. Maybe. You know, able to come out and mm. go to the pub now and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit uh, Ger and, and uh, Gibson, I think, are uh, giving me the same kind of idea of the hat. It's, it's, it's difficult for me to figure out a hat, but um, because we only have to wear the hat today, I suppose we can wear a different hat tomorrow. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So, one of the things I suppose that struck me was the red hat, in the sense of um, uh, people's well-being rather than health per se, you know, just people having a, a good life and uh, having a good experience of life. So I'll wear the red hat today. I'm good. Red hat. <laughs> Rosie? Um, I think I'd be an orange hat with a bit of yellow, so like a pale orange. You could have a band on it. <laughs> <laughs> with a bit of yellow? Yeah. different hat every day, I think. Um, I, what's the hat for uh, a dinosaur status? <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, uh, like Joe started out in sort of uh, the pirate radio world, I started out as a housing uh, apparatchik. And in a sense, you know, after a convoluted and zigzag journey, I've ended up sort of back there and re-engaging with that sector. Um, so, I, 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 yeah, I think I just wear a different hat um, wherever I find myself. Um, and I think maybe the red hat uh, is, is probably the one I would wear mostly. Okay. Uh, with the, like Gibson, uh, the academic hat then. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's, uh, no, it's... Uh, a multiplicity of hats, I think, ultimately. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks for that. Um, what I want to do is uh, I want to um, just talk about um, the basic idea behind Echoworld, but I, I want to tell you a story. And then, uh, I was in the company of some very good storytellers last night, Nick Gibson and James among them, so I'm certainly not a good, great storyteller. But it'll just, um, as I talk through what happened with this idea in Cork, it's, I think, the best way to, to explain uh, what we did with this idea uh, as a way of um, asking us and asking all of you what you might do with this idea. So, um, and I want to make it an, an interactive session in a different way, uh, in that um, if you want to pull out your smartphones, which, you know, a number of you, I may like to do, and as I go through the story, I'll be mentioning um, organisations, connections, and so on. Please just uh, Google them and look them up uh, and, and read up on them as you wish, because um, it's not a talk in, in a conventional sense. And I think uh, if you do find something interesting when you, when you look it up, you can bring it back into the discussion uh, and have it, have it interactive in that way as well. So. Uh, Please do that, particularly, you know, as I go through the story and you're maybe getting, you know, wandering, so just go for it and find, find whatever uh, leads I give you and look them up. So I want to just distribute a few copies of these for now, simply just to talk about the image on the cover. So, um, and it, it relates to, uh, I didn't catch your first name, the flat Roger. cap, Roger. Roger. It very, very much relates to how, how you described your own. Uh, sense, which is um, the space in, in the middle of all those colours and all those um, all those um, orbits, <coughs> if you like. So, um, part part of the story was that in 2011, uh, the Lifelong Learning Festival coordinator in Cork went to Australia to visit her daughter, and. Because she was visiting Australia, she thought, this is an opportunity. I should look up, is there anything like our Cork Lifelong Learning Festival in Australia? So she found one in, in uh, a suburb of Melbourne called Hume. It's called Hume Global Learning Village. She uh, reached out to them. They said, come on, uh, come and visit us, and we'll set up a meeting with you with the local council officials. Um, so she ended up in a very serious meeting of a council subcommittee uh, and addressed them, explained about the festival in Cork, uh, which I won't get into today, it's another story entirely, look it up, um, <coughs> Cork Lifelong Learning Festival. Uh, so she came back and said, you know, there's this thing in Australia, I think it's interesting, I think it's similar, um, you know, I, we, should, we should reach out to them. So the next time we had a festival, we said we would have a se seminar like this and we had been busy for a number of years doing lots of activities and Siobhan's community was one of the exemplars in that. Um, but we hadn't created space for thinking <coughs> much and we said we'd better do that. So we invited um, the uh, first of the familiar names you've come across, George Osborne, but not the George Osborne you're familiar with. We invited George Osborne to come mm. to visit us in Cork and speak at our seminar. So he did. And he spoke about Hume Global Learning Village and what they had done. And, you know, it was an example from afar. There was lots of lessons that we could take out of it. But what was really interesting about what happened afterwards was um, that he asked for a meeting with the Lifelong Learning Festival coordinator, someone from Health, the Red Hat, if you like, someone in the city to, that had responsibility for health, uh, somebody from city council, from local government, um, if possible, someone from the business sector, and someone from the environmental sector. So there was a scrabble around to think who might be invited to that meeting. And uh, there were a couple of obvious people came to mind. Uh, they were pulled together, and it was a quick discussion. And um, that was the start of uh, Echo Will Cork. So it was the first uh, time that uh, that idea that you bring those sectors together and work together uh, and try and find ways of working together. That was the first time uh, that kicked off in Cork. So the name Echo Well is a clunky name. We didn't like it at all at the start. Um, but it does what it says in the tin. The EC stands for Economy and Ecology or Environment. Uh, the Cork Environmental Forum rep uh, constantly says it should be environment, but it's EC for Ecology. The CO wraps up your community and culture, and the well is a combination of well for well-being and LL for lifelong learning. So it's all there in the name. Um, 
And when you have any get together, you have to ask, the first question you ask is who's not here? So we know, you know, in fair sense anyway, who's in this room, so who isn't here? So there's usually obvious, um, maybe missing voices. And the first um, challenge really of applying ECHOEL is how do you get uh, the missing voice into the room? And not just a representative of, we we'll say, the Chamber of Commerce, which is our struggle initially. How do you get the voice from business and the economy, the Cork economy, into the room? Um, we've uh, had about 10 years of experimenting with all sorts of partnerships in Ireland, and one of the things we learned uh, during that time is that if you look for a formal representative from various organisations, you will get one, but they'll all typically, and I've been, I've been that soldier, I've been sent to interagency meetings, um, Typically, they're not there because they want to be there. So we uh, decided not to do that in this case and to try and invite people who would want to be part of this. So um, the first challenge, I suppose, if you were to take the Equal idea and apply it in anywhere, in Ashton, is uh, who could be brought into the room uh, that might have the blue hat on or the red hat on, who might be concerned with those things and who wants to do something. So um, this is, you know, it is kind of uh, an active um, way of, of working. So one of the guys that came into the room that time was a guy who was very involved in uh, the cultural life of the city, and he, he devised this logo just as his contribution to this, and he set up a website as also his contribution. So very quickly I realised that um, there was enough energy out of, out of this that things were being done without a budget. Um, and that was a big surprise to me. So that, that image, I think, is very good because uh, all those colours we spoke about uh, today, the creativity is in the middle, as you can see. So you have to leave your, your red hat behind, if you like, and come somehow into the space in the middle, into the space that Roger's talking about to, to you know, not, not belong too closely to your silo. And it's in there that the creativity happens. And that's, um, that's, I suppose, a, a way we have found that works pretty well. So open space technology is something that Vicky has used in her own work, and it's a technique we use to keep us <coughs> reminded of um, by bringing people together from the various perspectives, but by looking to do something creative, um, you know, things can happen, things can change. So I'm going to stop there for just for now. I'm just checking with you. Is there... Um, Anybody wants to ask any question about that story so far? Anyone look up anything in their smartphone you want to check back on? So if, you, if, if you've got a group of people that are interested in buying an equal technique and you want someone with an extra help to do so, yeah. if you don't go to like a health partnership in the community, yeah. where else would you, would you get this? I don't know. Just, yeah, just fish about. Yeah. And reel them in. Yeah. But then if you reel them into it. Yeah, that won't work either. Yeah. Do, yeah. So typically we had to ask questions of ourselves in our own network. Who do you know in that world who might like to be part of this? And um, you know, it's back to solidarity. Um, and you know, it's not a closed none of our sessions have been closed since the start. We've um, when we've organize the public session, we keep it as absolutely open as possible, so anyone can come from any sector, they can wear whatever hat they want on the day, and um, they can connect in whatever way they want. But the working group that kind of got it going were people who kind of, kind of knew each other, knew broadly, would probably work well together. Um, and it's just, it's a very loose group, There's, you know, it's not funded, it's not a, uh, owned by any particular organization, um, you know, so it's, it's quite flexible. But uh, that was what we found worked in Cork, anyway. Um, any other just check-ins before I launch on to the next I'd, bit of the I'd, story? I mean, you refer to it like Cork as the city and the green city and the sustainable city. Yeah. Does it have applications in non-urban settings as well? Do you think that the concept can, you know, uh, work in, in rural settings, in sort of uh, out, outside of the sort of the, the, the city? concentration, if you like. You know. Yeah, I suppose the city was useful to us initially because all of us that got involved in the group mm. were concerned about the city. Mm. So the uh, Healthy Cities Coordinator was mm. one of the driving force behind it, the Lifelong Learning Festival Coordinator, my own role with the City Vocational Education Committee, 
um, Cork Environmental Forum. So this, the city was just the, the, the thing, our common cause. Yeah. Um, and we'd learned a bit, there's been a sequence of courses done in Cork called uh, Common Purpose. So oh, yeah. look it up. Uh, and those of us that had participated in that had a sense of this way of working anyway. And um, so the common cause could be Ashton. Mm. The common cause could be uh, developing um, an arts project. Um, the common cause be, could be anything. And no. we will we'll get onto bits of the story, or do you want to, to fast forward quickly into when we applied the EchoWell idea to UCC itself mm. and put it together? Do people get together around a common cause, or do the people get together first? And um, yeah, you can do either. either yeah, it's quite flexible. I suppose in our case, as I say, we had the city development was our common cause already. So yeah. it, uh, we started asking questions about what can we do to advance the things in the city uh, by bringing all these perspectives together. But you could get each individual to represent each organisation yeah. and women to women go around asking for an update on yeah. each. Yeah, well, good. I think, I think um, with Echoville is, um, uh, and you mentioned we, we did in UCC as well, uh, so people contributed and so on and so forth. Um, what, what astonished me about it was uh, the event in City Hall, when was that 2013? Yeah, that was the, the following year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was an event in City Hall in Cork, and uh, there must have been, what, three, four hundred people? There was 250 people signed up for it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, which was astounding mm. because they, they came from everywhere. Mm. Every conceivable kind of organisation or individual or whatever turned up, mm. and uh, I think it said something about a kind of um, a kind of a sense in Cork to say, "Oh my God, we need to do something." You know, and they may not have had a clear agenda about what they wanted to do, but they felt. You know, we, we have to go and find out uh, what's happening here and uh, see what we can do. And I think I think it's interesting that there's uh, no resources, like there's no there's no budget, so there's no budget holder. So people don't start fighting over the money because there isn't any money to fight over. Uh, and the fact that it's flexible and open enough that you can just contribute. But I, I would say, uh, and this is a sense I have of Echowell and Cork now, is that the energy has gone out of it, I would think. Um, and uh, there's a need to re-energise it, uh, and I think this is this is the thing. I think um, it's, it's 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 organic, and so on. But I think um, you know, I suppose everybody's business is nobody's business. So somebody at at the moment, I mean, I would say in the last six eight months, there, there's been no visible movement in Echo well really now. Probably people are distracted by the learning city, I think, probably at the moment. Yeah, that's yeah. part of the story, I think. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. part of it. But I think, I think um, it's something like that, that uh, could start at a huge level of energy and so on and so forth. But if you don't keep you know, contributing to that energy, then the whole thing could dissipate. And I think there's a danger for Ickowell for that to happen, I'll be honest about it. And that's the sense I have. Mm. Uh, I, I have a sense of frustration about Ickowell, I'll be honest about it, because I, I feel you know, uh, you know, I've ideas and <coughs> things I'd like to do, and also, I suppose, maybe I haven't time to do them. But there doesn't seem to be any coming together of Echoel just now, and maybe it's just a, a lacuna at the moment, and maybe it's going to, maybe it just goes through phases, and maybe it's the learning city thing. But I, I think this is one of the th the challenges of it. You know, it is very organic, and it's everybody contributing, but you know, it, still, it still requires people to animate it at some level. To sort of, you know, people take responsibility at different times, maybe, and say, okay, if I have an idea, let's do this with it, or if I have an idea, let's do that with it. And like, there might not be big things, about it, but you just need to keep some sort of life in the thing. No, I think you're absolutely right. The, um, the lesson out of, out of the last number of years is the, when the core team haven't had time to meet each other, and everyone's busy, and everyone I know yeah. around this table has a load going on as well, uh, then things don't happen. Uh, and I would kind of, I suppose, reflect back to the UCC group, why not go ahead and have a group meeting again and think, you know, some of the ideas that are there, what, what needs to happen to make some of those happen. Um, it isn't a, like other projects, that it depends on kind of 
you know, anyone really. Yeah. It's quite open that way. And um, I suppose very early on in the, in the evolution, one particular topic um, took on its energy of its own. Um, it, was, it came out of the health concern and it was to do with food. So uh, a grouping, including one of your colleagues in UCC, connected with someone in the Central Statistics Office, believe it or not, who is involved in, he wears a load of different other hats. But there's a Cork Food Policy Council in place now that didn't exist three years ago. And that, um, a bit like Echo, well, once the group is there and the energy is there and the focus is there, they have attracted in the resources that they need to redistribute food from supermarkets to charities. Um, so late last night after we made our grand our grand uh, entrance into the hotel, I happened to see something on, on late night TV about the same issue, food waste. And uh, the Food Policy Council isn't just concerned with food waste, it's concerned with food production, with um, you know some of what Siobhan's Green Hat is all about, um, healthy, nutritious food, appropriately grown, locally sourced if possible, so you're not creating all uh, the environmental aspects and all everything that's con concerned with that. And that is a group that has emerged from uh, an, an initial discussion um, and they've just carried on with that work since. And when we have broader events, <coughs> they come along and contribute, but they don't depend on any outside kind of <coughs> connection to do their own work. Um, but just by bringing people together, it kicked it off, just the first discussion. Yeah. Maybe just to say that it is actually continuing. Now I'm not involved in Food Policy Council, but Colin Sage is, uh, and one of the events that they had was they went around all the multiples. And you know, you have this distinction between use by and best before. Mm. Uh, so they collected vegetables from the various different multiples and they, they created a vegetarian curry for 5,000 people around the St. Patrick's Day yeah. Festival, just to highlight the issue of, 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 of food waste. Now, how that's actually continued into the university is that the university is in, in the process of developing a sustainability policy and they're negotiating um, with local organic farmers to locally produce vegetables for use in catering in the universities and again to, to link that into various different student activities and allotments. So th those connections do continue, maybe not at a high level of visibility, mm. but they are actually continuing mm. underneath the surface. Yeah. As with big problems like food, like energy, like sustainability, um, this was what, what's beginning to be understood by the likes of um, uh, Pascal, which emerged from work done on learning cities by the OECD, and again, look, look that up. Um, and they have a, um, a network called Pascal International Exchanges, or PI, again, do, do have a look at that, um, is that those big problems are not going to be solved by one department or one perspective, that if you don't get multiple perspectives, which is very, very difficult work to do, it's very complex and it's very challenging. And um, our own experience in Cork is that it can be done you have to invent it as you go along. It's very creative work, really. Um, some of what I heard in the voices on um, Blueberry Soup yesterday evening kind of resonated with that. You know, what do you want to do now? You know, some of the younger people were saying, what do you want to do now? Um, can you live your own dream rather than consume someone else's dream? You know, what, what do you want to do about it? Um, so this, this type of approach um, has been useful to us in Cork. Can it be useful in the context that you're all working in? Um, I don't know. It's up, up to you. Can only know it by trying it. Um, I suppose the this. The well, thing, Dennis, maybe that's. Uh, I think important about the, the whole equitable thing as well is the the and you mentioned the Pascal and those. I mean, it's the the, the connections, you know, um, uh, connections to other Echowell experiments in other places and looking at what they're doing and so on and so forth. And I think that's that's a critical part of it, that you're not kind of isolated, yes. working in your own little place and say, oh, we're doing all this in Ashington or whatever, and we don't know what's happening in the rest of the world. Yes. And it, it kind of energizes you that you say, oh, well, there's stuff going on in Glasgow or there's stuff going on in Cork or there's stuff going on somewhere else that you're kind of connecting and linking in with. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the Lifelong Learning Festival in Cork, uh, and I know we're going to talk about that again, maybe, whatever, but it's, it's an interesting like you were asking uh, Vicky in a sense about, you know, uh, how, how, where does the agenda come from? In a sense, the Lifelong Learning Festival kind of created a lot of those agendas. It, 
itself, it kind of it kind of drove a lot of thinking, I think, because people started talking to each other and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways it kind of it kind of created a, a kind of a nucleus of a kind of a group because a lot of the ones are the same kind of people that are involved in both of them. Um, and um, you know, so uh, the, the with the lifelong learning festival, what, what, what I noticed is that um, it kind of it kind of got uh, picked up internationally. People around the world spotted this thing happening in Cork, and you know, like when you, when you go places, uh, people say, "Oh, you know, you're from Cork. What oh, is the lifelong learning festival in Cork? Oh, yeah, tell me more about that." And so on and so forth. They ask everybody about it, and in a sense, it has two impacts. Uh, one, it, it, it uh, gives you a sense of say, well, you know, maybe something is happening here which is interesting. And the thing at the same time, with Rebecca, well, with um, Mike Osborne, wasn't it, saying, you know, what's happening in Cork is something kind of unique and special. And then you, you can sort of value more what you're doing yourself. And it kind of forces you to say, okay, God, you know, if we are doing something good, we better keep, keep going and do it more. And it energizes people locally. And I think that's one of the big things about the Echowell thing, you know, that, you know, somebody in Australia says, oh, God, you know what you're doing there in Cork is interesting. <coughs> And say, God, yeah, maybe it is, you know. Um, mm. So I think that's. Yeah, I suppose that was part of the story, certainly. Yeah. Um, there was an opportunity that particular year because it was a, a year called, there was a, a national project called The Gathering to get people um, from overseas, the diaspora, to come back to Ireland that particular year. So there was a fund to do work like that. So we used that as a source of funding for that conference. You know, you can't do things like that without some support. Um, but I was amazed at how easy it was to source additional funding from the likes of our health service mm -hmm. because there was a health dimension to it from my, my own organisation, the education training board, because there was a learning dimension to it. Um, this was one of the important things I should have said earlier is um, by working in this particular way, all of those agendas are equal. Just by, by, by the nature of, of how the group is structured. Any particular discussion can prioritise <coughs> The economic aspect, or the health aspect, or the learning aspect, or the green aspect, or whatever. But you know, the whole concept is that they all have a place in this way of working, and none is more important than the other. And you, they're interdependent <coughs> as well. You can't uh, address one particular challenge without thinking of, of the other. Um, so that particular conference was um, just part of the story, really. There was an opportunity we had. Uh, we were able to access some funding for it. We got. Um, international speakers, and this is one of the other names that you're familiar with. Michael Parkinson was one, but he's not the guy you are familiar with. He's um, from, I uh, think, uh, he's from Liverpool, Moore, John Moore's University. Uh, just we had four speakers, international speakers, on the four topics. So we had a WHO speaker about healthy cities, we had a speaker from Vittoria Gastes in the north of Spain, who had that year's EU Green Capital. Uh, we had uh, Mike Osborne from Glasgow University who spoke about learning cities and the whole drive towards uh, a, a way of uh, designating learning cities by UNESCO. And um, we had um, uh, Michael Parkinson to speak about uh, second cities and the economic drivers that they can be in their own regions by virtue of the fact that they're smaller than the capital. So that they give bigger bang for your buck if you invest in second cities. So that was his perspective. Um, but the key, keynote speakers, in effect, weren't the, weren't the most important thing. The fact that all the perspectives were being covered meant, I think, that the 250 people signed up for it. Uh, and so that was just one part of the story. Um, other parts of the story are just as important in lots of ways. Uh, but the direct follow-up to that was that Mike Osborne, who was involved in the UNESCO dimension, uh, contacted UNESCO and said, what's happening in Cork is interesting, so just to take up Seamus's point that the connection between places happens because of these type of, uh, of events. Just a question, Rosie's got a question. Sorry, Rosie, it's about um, you. I was just wondering where else are there are eco-world projects going on? In the world? Yeah, it's a um, It's quite new, I suppose. Um, we had a session out in, in, uh, in Cork Institute of Technology and, and they were very concerned to see where else in the world it had been tried already. And, uh, one of the people who was very strong asking it uh, wasn't so happy to hear that, that there wasn't one. So we were creating this, using the ideas that are elsewhere, and it has been applied in different ways elsewhere, but you know, we were at that time, which is quite new. Um, Glasgow ha are interested in working in this way. So are uh, Taipei, and they have um, a city council led 
uh, track record of combining their strategy for Taipei as a learning city, Taipei as a green city, Taipei as a harbour city. So they have pulled all those ideas together and that was the spark that uh, Peter Cairns originally kind of took up. <coughs> so Taipei, if you're interested in looking up, see, see what they're doing. And uh, interestingly, Taipei are also interested in the learning neighbourhoods idea, so they're trying to learn with us about how to roll that out. Yep. So um, I suppose there's lots of ways we've applied it since, uh, including looking at Cork Harbour as a, an economic driver in the area, um, a health campus, which was an old hospital, which has now been reimagined as a, a multidisciplinary uh, base. Uh, we applied it to use a session to consult around uh, the planning, the new development plan for the city, and bring all those perspectives into the new development plan for the city. Um, UCC used the approach to develop a group within the university um, and learning neighbourhoods I suppose is one of the ways we are going to just do a quick exercise on it now. Um, one of the, before we get to that, um, I suppose the, the one of the definite uh, impacts of working in this way for Cork is that the uh, UNESCO award um, as a model of good practice uh, as a learning city was awarded to Cork in September and without doing this echo well story that wouldn't have happened just also I would be here you know so there's lots of things that have come out of it but that was one of the things so as part of our work on learning cities we have a commitment to developing two pilot learning neighbourhoods one is Barry Fahan that Siobhan has spoken about and the other is Nath Nahini so Siobhan O'Sullivan will yep. maybe give it back on to you just very briefly now because I know we're, we're uh, over time um, like Dennis was saying, uh, Cork City was awarded um, Learning City in uh, September just gone. Uh, it's one of three in Europe and one of 12 in the world. And um, aiming to, I suppose, follow from that is to localise some of the initiatives coming out of Learning Cities into particular neighbourhoods. So we're piloting it in Nakmahini and Ballyfahan, who two social housing areas that you were saying yesterday, Sean, Ballyfahan, one of the oldest in, in the city. Uh, not Mahini, uh, a, a younger um, area, uh, so it's two. They face some similar issues, but have very different demographics. And one of the biggest issues um, faced is low levels of educational attainment and alienation from further and higher education to a certain extent. And um, just from some of our, our talking with people in the community, and um, one of the things that, that people said was, you know, when they went into a third level campus like UCC, they felt that even the walls were saying to them, you don't belong here. And if somebody from you know, the head of school or head of a department came into the room, they thought they were coming in to kick them out, you know, that they knew that they were from uh, one of the, the communities that really, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be here. And um, so Learning Neighbourhoods is, is, uh, aims to work with a range of um, education and, and um, learning interests in each of the neighbourhoods to really we're piloting this so it's to co-create a model together with, with a range of different people and, and an approach to learning neighborhoods to promote to acknowledge to showcase active lifelong learning from not right up to people in their 90s and however far we're going to go so we've we've um, already met with a range of groups from each neighborhood and uh, we wanted to conduct a short exercise what peter kearns has called a, a quick and dirty learning audit to see what's already happening because Dennis has said it before at meetings, you know, these are already learning neighbourhoods. We, we just don't recognise, you know, what, what they've achieved over the years. And, you know, some of the statistics, we see it in, in the Irish census, some of them have improved in terms of educational attainment, but there's still huge inequality um, and, and big distinctions um, for, uh, between the city as a whole and the country as a whole for people uh, in, these, in these areas. And we want to see what, what works in these neighbourhoods as well and transfer that learning to other neighbourhoods and, and foster greater networking, maybe using the EcoWell approach across different dimensions so that it's not just about you know, the groups who work in learning, but can we intersect with business, can we uh, intersect with the uh, environmental groups, you know, can, we, can we broaden out um, that base. And I think what's come out for me, uh, importantly, out of the meetings that we've had in the community, is we've had several years of austerity in Ireland and some of these community groups and, and different organisations have been hard hit by that and there's been a loss of staff and a loss of, of programmes. Um, and, but there's been great enthusiasm around learning cities and learning neighbourhoods and people see it as a, a, a more positive approach after many years of, of, of hardship. 
and a positive for what they're what, what's already being done, but also to maybe try something new um, as well to add something new. And whether that's uh, through EcoWell, and um, we come we have a steering group that's between the Education and Training Board, UCC, uh, and Cork City Council, who are all uh, supporting the project. We come up with some ideas that we're we're hoping to pilot with the with the groups, um, which includes a kind of faces of learning poster campaign, and um, for people who are already actively engaged, and to encourage people, you know, these are the faces of learning in your in your neighbourhoods, and um, a lecture series. Um, we've had 50 uh, UCC lecturers sign up to deliver a community-based uh, open kind of lecture, and um, both in in the two neighbourhoods, but also through the Lifelong Learning Festival, and um, that. We'll bring people from communities down to UCC and you know open open it up a bit, as well as specific projects in each area. So people in in, in the different groups that came and and residents in the areas were talking about um, fostering community exchanges across uh, Cork City is kind of divided between north and south. The river and um, the channels run run through it. So fostering that uh, exchange between the two sides, an intergenerational choir, community gardens, there's loads of of uh, great ideas that people want to develop uh, in their neighbourhoods. Um, so I suppose I'll, I'll hand it back to Dennis to see you know what we could do with with EcoWell. Um, we have the the LL part of, mm. of learning neighbourhoods. We have the CO <coughs> part of learning neighbourhoods. We probably could do more to uh, expand our horizons. Mm. So learning neighbourhoods is one idea, as I say, you, when you find a project that people are committed to, or it comes from the people themselves about the project. Sorry, there. Uh, you could then start asking the questions we've been kind of talking about earlier. So you, know, you should talk about the, the, the one in, the, in um, St Mary's, because that was a really interesting uh, consultation, the health one. Um, yeah, I suppose I'll just briefly describe the method, because we've used the same. Um, there's been an event probably every six months or so since we started this in 2012. Um, and as I say, it's covered all the different topics. Uh, around this time last year we had one to do with the campus, uh, St Mary's, as it was a, an old um, fever hospital, so <coughs> lots of buildings separate. Uh, it's no longer in use as an orthopaedic hospital now, so <coughs> the HSE <coughs> were developing plans for it, uh, and uh, we um, used different topics, for example, uh, energy. So a campus like that, um, we had a short two minute intro for someone who has uh, a background in, in alternative approaches to energy projects for a campus like that. And then the group who came on the day, there's about 80 people turned up. We've had significantly high numbers for any one of these events. And I think it's partially because it's multi, multi topic. Whereas, you know, events we had prior to that, 40 was our, our average, and then we'd be happy with that. You know, that's, that's consistently been, been, um, been our experience. So, uh, so energy, transport, um, the environment uh, as a learning campus, um, health obviously was one of its core missions. So your groups uh, divided up, uh, each kind of feeding ideas to each other and capturing those ideas. It's quite fluid in that people can stand up and leave one discussion group and join another if they feel they've contributed enough, if they've heard enough. And all of those ideas were collated and uh, discussed with the HSE. And the, the estates, the national estates manager attended that morning. And he drove, he told me afterwards, he was driving up the avenue that morning thinking, what have I ever said so far? Because he was expecting a, a public consultation, which is, why aren't G doing this? Why are, you know, why didn't G do it? Whereas, you know, just by working in this particular way, support ideas generation. There's no guarantee any of those ideas will be in, inputted, and we make that very clear. But there's a health, it is a healthy chance that the ideas that will be uh, implemented will be better for all of those <coughs> other ideas. So that, that was that example. I'm going to go back to the learning neighbourhoods example and ask Siobhan just to, yeah, to uh, reflect on um, what's happened so far in Ballyfehan with the group that have come together and how the other topics, the business or the economic interests of the area, environmental dimension, the, the green or envir uh, uh, yeah, sorry, the environmental is already covered. Um, health is kind of uh, learning and social inclusion. Social inclusion and learning are probably well covered. Have you any reflections on any of the other hats that could be brought to bear on it? I think, like one of the things is there. There are so many labels for cities now. Uh, you know, smart city, healthy city, 
eco city, green city, learning city, um, and then you're trying to transfer a little of that or not locally. Um, but things like um, one, what could be done intergenerationally, so people learning together that maybe didn't often learn together, um, and learning from one another, not just from the experts outside, um, but from what people know of their own community. Um, it's 19, you know, we, we've kind of we've been in a decade of commemorations of a sort anyway, and, and 1916, 2016 will, will kind of reflect on the, the creation of the state and um, Balfahan was built around the time of the 50th commemoration of the Easter Rising. So all of the, all of the, the road names, the place names are after the signatories to the proclamation of the Republic. Um, so there, you know, there's a really interesting um, kind of a local group about how how Balfahan will look back on its 50 years, but also link into the kind of state stuff that's happening. Um, and in terms of maybe newer projects, um, because it, it um, was one of the first built communities, that certainly in, in two big areas, um, you have you have a whole load of people who are reaching their 80s together. Um, it is twice the national average. Two of the, the DEDs have twice the na national average of older people. Um, so this is what some of the rest of the city and the country will look like in another 20 years. But Balafan is there. So maybe kind of dementia-friendly initiatives, um, age-friendly stuff. Um, and, you know, age-friendly, not in a kind of social service type way, not in a more help, more doing things for, but the, like um, the older people's networks we work with and have helped set up. Um, they're brilliant leaders in and of themselves. They, they don't need the Community Development Project to do, um, to do their work. Uh, what they do use us for is networking and helping to secure funding. So I think looking at who the population is and, and what kinds of things as a community if we were reflecting on the makeup, would we learn and learn together around that? Yeah. So that's maybe the health and the social inclusion, but also the kind of intergenerational bit of it. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> now we need to draw to a close, but I'm certainly open to any uh, feedback from yourselves on <coughs> ways of improving the learning neighbourhoods idea by bringing more of an economic perspective to it, or um, an artistic perspective, or a green perspective, or um, and that conversation, you know, we kicked it off in this session, but I would um, hope that that will continue uh, for the tea break, but also maybe in an ongoing way as we go into the future. Oh, great. Thanks very much for doing the tea uh, Dennis and the future ones. I just, just two final thoughts for just from Gibson and John. Gibson, I, I grew up reading George Sorrell um, on anarcho-syndicalism. And this is, I suppose this is an example of a uh, participatory forum. Mm. Is there something about this, you know, we're talking about thoughts developed at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, about collective organisation through syndicates. Um, and we're talking here about um, a, a new forum in which people come voluntarily together. Is there something about, this, what is it about the two contexts? Do you, do you think there's something about the two contexts which has shaped the way in which people imagine collective organisation? Are there, seriously radical potential uh, possibilities which, which lie behind forums like this, do you think? Or? Yeah, there's two ways in, in uh, aren't there? Um, I, one is to think from a utopian sort of perspective, and we've all got our own different utopias, but I don't think there's any radical, pro any radical project that doesn't have behind it some utopian thinking, you know, about what things might look like in a better sort of society. So if you start from at that end, and I think we were talking about that before, about your imaginary has got to be that, but the pressures on people today to think that utopianism is, you know, pie in the sky, it's, it's a dirty word, isn't it? You, you, to have some sort of utopian sort of perspective. And again, it's the pressure just to think about what is doable, what's pragmatic, and that's about as far as, as we get. 
but I think that um, they get some sort of sense about thinking the impossible. To, you know, to, saying I was an academic, to get students just to think about uh, what possibilities there are, and they find it incredibly difficult. You would think that 18, 19, 20 year olds, you know, would be just full of ideas about old radical imaginaries of the future. And unfortunately, the vast majority I've spoken to are locked into a trajectory which is the way in which, it, you know, it is. So, yeah, I, I think stuff which actually works at the pragmatic level is incredibly important, but we've also got to have those radical imaginaries, I think, about what we really, you know, would you ever know that something was so mind-blowingly exciting and different? And it's very hard to know that um, one has got that, concept there. I didn't explain that very well, but you know, it's almost as if you can't conceptualize it because you're told, well, that's daft. Don't. Don't do that. That's only daft. But, uh, you know, I think th those thought experiments about what would it look like de novo from the start um, need to be done as well as starting from, you know, where we are at the moment. Just to we briefly reflect, I suppose, some of the practical outcomes of the thinking process that is happening for the harbour. Um, there was a local county council there, there was a local area plan has gone through council because she was part of that. So she took, you know, discussion every day and did something with it. Yeah. Um, and thought better, you know, about what could be rather than yeah. Yeah. with the struggles, you know, which typically yeah. can can bog people down. Um, the health campus will have a social enterprise um, catering facility rather than, you know, your, your corporate model. We will have an eco-friendly garden now, you know, part of that whole discussion because of the, the commitment to it. Um, so the, the imagining of the future can, can also be part of, you know, I think this imagining practical things that are achievable in the short term that can build towards a very different idea of what St. Mary's Health mm -hmm. Campus will look like in 100 years time, 20 years time, which where it will be a well-being campus rather than health campus and you know a long way from the hospital that it was for people that were in the very now, some of the things that are you know, very small things that are actually make big impacts in people's lives that they people were talking about uh, being able to walk their dogs mm. around the grounds you know <laughs> so, you know we want to be able to walk our dogs around the grounds which is an important thing to be able to do you know and like it sounds like a very small thing but i don't think the hsc had ever thought about that they have, would never have made provision mm. to allow people to walk their dogs in there and the other thing that people spoke about is that the um, the, the campus is <coughs> actually connects two ends of, of a neighbourhood, and they were saying, well, you know, there's only one entrance. If there was another entrance at the other end, we could walk through or we could cycle through, and we could, you know, uh, connect up and down. And I think they, they hadn't even they hadn't thought about that either, you know, because it wouldn't have been in their <coughs> their framework. But those are very very small things at one level, but in terms of the. The, the lived experience of people in that neighbourhood, there would be fantastic additions to, you know, the amenity of the place. Mm. One of the, you talked about basic income, yeah. and in one sense, you know, it's basic, um, but a, a lot of proponents of basic income talk about the radical potential of basic mm. income. I don't know, but in counterpart with these sorts of forums, what, what creative capacities does it offer? Well, well I mean, I, do, I, I, mean, I was kind of thinking some thoughts along the same line as, uh, as Gibson and, and what you guys have just said to you know, like there's a difference between I mean every project is inevitably going to be you know what can we do here and now right? it's whether you see that as on a traje tra trajectory towards something that is you know really better and you know it's a vision of a, of a much better world or it's just you know filling a hole in the pavement right and I mean the, the other thought that was occurring to me, I mean, I know this isn't quite an answer to your question. The, the other thing that was occurring to me is that, you know, I mean, there are essentially two models of how, how of, of what the relationships are in a society or in a city or whatever. One is, oh, we're all in it together, you know, let's cooperate and so on. And the other model is, there are fundamental conflicts of interest here between the people who are in power and who are privileged and the people who are at the shit end of the stick, right? And, yeah, I mean, the, sometimes, I mean, particularly in, in the world we're in today, you know, 
you have to use a model that is ostensibly of the first kind. We're all in it together, let's see how we can do it, right? For the sake of actually promoting the interests of the people who are the shit under the stick. And you know, and, and as long as you're clear about that, that's grand. And it sounds from what you guys are saying that you you are clear about that, right? And and that's fine, but but the, there's such a risk of falling into the idea that oh, you know, we're all in it together and it you know, the it's so, so what if the people in Balfan are, you know, educationally disadvantaged, you know, living crap housing, you know, well, uh, then, well, yeah, they, they're just citizens of court who have problems just like the people who are living down the Western Road or whatever. I mean, you know, it, it, at some stage, somebody, whether explicitly or in the interest of citizens, has to see that there are complex interests here and there has to be a fight as well as a, a, as well as a, Happy fun 